and welcome everyone to the 16th quarterly cash briefing uh, by Treasury Strategies. I'm Tony Carfang, I'm a partner with Treasury Strategies, and I'm joined by my Treasury Strategies colleague, uh, Kevin Ruiz, who is a leader in our corporate practice working with Treasury Strategies corporate clients. As you know, Treasury Strategies consults with both corporations and financial institutions in the area of Treasury payments and liquidity. We're joined today by uh, an expert panel, uh, which includes Debbie Cunningham from Federated Investors, uh, Peter Matza of the Association of Corporate Treasurers, and Roger Merritt of Fitch Ratings. I must say, we have our fingers crossed here. There's a uh, citywide transit strike in London, and, uh, and, and we're having a little bit of difficulty getting everyone on here simultaneously. But we'd like to thank our uh, sponsors and partners, Federated Investors, the Association of Corporate Treasurers, and Fitch Ratings uh, for, 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 for their support in this. And we'd also like to thank you for your business. It's your business that keeps the oxygen in the room and keeps these cash briefings going. So we thank you very much. As a quick aside, everyone attending will receive a recording link and a copy of the presentation deck. And in addition, the, the, the presentation will be published on the tr brand new Treasury Strategies YouTube channel, which is the largest organized collection of Treasury and payments intellectual capital on all of YouTube. We welcome you to visit. We'll have more about that later, but for those of you who are experienced with YouTube, just search Treasury Strategies and we will show up as on, on the top of the list and click on the channel. Uh, one housekeeping detail, there, there's, a, there's a box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen where you can submit questions. We would like to reply as thoughtfully as possible to those questions, so we will not be answering them during the webinar, but rather providing everyone with a written summary. We have a full agenda today. I will be speaking about the corporate cash levels, and we continue to have interesting developments each quarter in the, uh, in, in, in the story of corporate cash. Uh, Kevin Ruiz will talk about what's, what's top of mind for our Treasury clients. What are the corporate treasurer's priorities? And specifically, what have they been telling us, and what have they not been telling us? And I think that there's an awful lot that we can glean from that. Then we move to our game changers, and with our panel, uh, five really important hot topics to talk about today. Uh, the situation in Greece, the situation in China, uh, potential interest rate liftoff, which keeps you know, getting pushed further and further out, uh, the availability of high quality liquid assets in the marketplace and the possibility of some shortages there, which is fascinating, and bank repositioning as a result of the business environment and the regulatory environment. So it's a very full agenda, and uh, we look forward to uh, sharing the next 45 minutes with you. Let's jump right into our corporate cash levels and the statistical analysis. Uh, you're all familiar with, with, the, with these charts. I, I think now that we have a 15-year uh, time series, one of the remarkable things is the consistency of the trend lines, particularly in uh, the U.S., the U.K., and the Eurozone. Uh, if it, the trend lines are, for, for the most part, unbroken over the 15-year period. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to, to look at the data in that perspective. In the last quarter, cash ticked down just slightly in the U.K. and the, uh, the U.S. Uh, continues to move up in uh, Japan. And we, we, have a, we had a fourth quarter uptick in the Eurozone, which has not yet released its first quarter data. Uh, so, so we're not quite sure what, what, where that's going to go. One of the fascinating things about looking at the 15-year uh, trend line is it's hard to spot that period after the financial crisis when pundits and regulators were scolding corporate treasurers for hoarding cash and blaming uh, some of the uh, economic slowdown on the fact that there, there was corporate cash hoarding and ascribing a nefarious motive. In 2011, Treasury Strategies, uh, as we work with you corporate treasurers, uh, realized that the that, there, that there's nothing nefarious at all and that you were all making appropriate business decisions uh, given, given your own circumstances. And 
we decided to begin this cash briefing series to shed, you know, put some sunlight on the situation and dispel the, um, the, the hoarding myth. And now as you look back at these time series, it, it is really hard to spot what regulators were uh, uh, criticizing you for as hoarding. You can't see that on this chart at all. Uh, what's, what's fascinating is, you know, the, the, the trend line remains fairly consistent uh, all, you, know, you can see blips around the financial crisis, uh, but keep in mind QE1, QE2, QE3, uh, the ECB's stimulus programs, uh, Operation Twist were all hitting in, in, in this period, and you really can't find them on the charts, which kind of says that there is something else, that there is a strong upward bias in the preference of corporations to hold more cash. Uh, if you do the math on the uh, U.S., Eurozone, and, and U.K., you, you find corporate cash has been going up over 15 years at a compounded growth rate of between 55 and 7%, uh, de depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, that's awfully consistent, and it's faster than local uh, GDP. Uh, we at Treasury Strategies are working with you, and uh, – and we, and, and we continue to, to, to help you all define the appropriate liquidity leverage uh, uh, levels f for your company. Now, if, if, if we look at each of the regions, you know, as, 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 as we said, corporate cash had been growing faster than GDP in the regions. And we can see, although each of the regions started at a different starting point, in the U.S., corporate cash was 9% of GDP. Uh, in Japan, it was 37%. And across all regions, it has moved up in the U.S. from 9 to 11, in Japan from 37 to 52, and uh, up, up, up in the other regions as well. So th 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 this is not a specific localized trend, uh, but, but rather a, uh, a global phenomenon of corporations holding more cash. Now let's take a look at what's going on at the central banks, uh, commercial banks, obviously hold reserves at central banks, and th this chart, another familiar chart, I, I think is particularly revealing this time. And what, what, we, what we see across this is across all four of these regions, and we have the Swiss National Bank there rather than the Bank of Japan, uh, because we want to make a specific point about that in a minute. Uh, but what you see is all four of these regions executing what are very divergent strategies here or had been divergent over, over, over the last several years. And this creates risk and uncertainty in the market that all of you are dealing with. Uh, you can see the, uh, in, in the U.S. the ending, uh, or the, the tapering of the quantitative easing and the ultimate uh, uh, ending of that. Uh, in the ECB, there's been an amazing ride where, 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 uh, where, where bank reserve balances uh, shot way up and then came way back down. I'll have more about that in a second. Uh, things have been actually pretty level in terms of bank reserves at the Bank of England for the last three years. And in the bottom right, the Swiss National Bank, you, you, we can see from 2012 through the beginning of 2015, a, uh, a, a very flat line which, which corresponds or coincides with the period where the uh, Swiss National Bank had set a trading range and, and published the trading range uh, for the Swiss franc uh, uh, to trade in the marketplace. And again, you know, one of the risks that you as, as, as treasurers face is when you have that, that sort of artificial control, oh, look what happens when that control ends. And, 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 and we saw that in January when the Swiss National Bank uh, you know, removed that ban, uh, and we, 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 we can see uh, – you know, uh, uh, about a 15% spike in bank reserves at the Swiss National Bank, and you, and you all experience the foreign exchange volatility. Uh, one of the things that we want to point out, and, you know, we, we lined up on the left the U.S. Federal Reserve above the European Central Bank. And if you were to look at a, 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 a period of, say, from, uh, from January or, or from December of 2012, through you know, and, and looking forward for about 18 months in the U.S., you see reserves, uh, banks, the banks were holding at the U.S. Fed rose by about a trillion dollars, and in exactly the same period, reserves at the European Central Bank fell by, by 800 billion 
uh, euro, which coincidentally is about a trillion dollars. Uh, and it was in December of 2012 that the ECB lowered its overnight uh, uh, rate uh, the, 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 that it pays to banks on, on reserve. And as, as we mentioned in an earlier cash briefing, we think there's been about a trillion dollar arbitrage where, where money has actually left uh, the, the, the European Central Bank and moved to the U.S. Uh, Fed. Uh, that, that's obviously a big overhang on the market, and we're going to talk more about that later. Uh, in fact, we're going to be referring back to this chart in, in, in a minute. So. Uh, just get, get, get this in your mind as we move on, and, and then, then we're going to come back to this. Uh, the, the next set of statistics uh, that we want to deal with very quickly here is the central bank assets. You know, the central banks have been ballooning uh, since the financial crisis. And if, but if we scale those assets according to GDP by region, we actually find that in the U.S., the, uh, the, the U.K., and uh, the, the Eurozone, uh, that ratio seems to have leveled out at somewhere between 22 and 25 percent. In the U.S., uh, the Fed's assets are 25 percent of U U.S. GDP. In the U.K., Bank of England's assets are 22 percent. In the Eurozone, the European Central Banks are about 23 percent. It's interesting, if you look back before the crisis, both the U.S. and the Bank of England uh, were you know, also started from the same starting point at a little bit above 5 percent. The Eurozone was higher. Now, if you look at the bottom right-hand chart, though, you see a huge outlier with the Bank of Japan, whose central bank assets are more than 60% of Japanese GDP. Uh, and that's more than twice the levels of the other three uh, zones and re jurisdictions that, that we're examining. Not quite sure what that means, but uh, when we see outliers of that magnitude, we know that's something to keep an eye on, and we will be keeping an eye on that for you. Now, here's a chart that just knocked us off our chair. Uh, we looked at this and we said, whoa. Uh, this was published in the International Journal of Central Banking, and I have a hard time getting ahead, my head around what on earth would, would that be about. Uh, but it, it, it was written by a group of economists from, from the New York Federal Reserve Bank, so, so this has an awful lot of credibility. The, um, the chart that you saw earlier that showed the rise of reserves and then the tapering off of the U.S. Fed is to the left of the solid line, and that, that, that's the actual part on this chart. What these economists from the New York Fed uh, state in their articles projection that all of that inflation of the Fed's balance sheet due to bank reserves and other liabilities at the Federal Reserve is like is projected to be unwound actually o over the course of a very few years. Uh, we're talking three trillion dollars here moving around in a relatively short period of time, and of course the Treasury strategies we you know our our, our mission is to help you all uh, chart your course through this. One, a couple consequences uh, very very quickly. Banks use their reserves at the Fed to qualify as. Uh, uh, high quality liquid assets to meet their Basel III requirements. Should this chart come to pass, there's, there, there will be uh, two and a half trillion, possibly, of high quality liquid assets that will leave the balance sheets of U.S. banks, which means that they need to reduce the, the, the amount of deposits that they take in by the same amount. And, you know, we can only imagine what that does to your, your corporate treasury operations. Or, uh, they need to replace that with other high quality assets like government securities and we're going to be talking a little bit about the supply of government securities and, wh and whether whether there's an, an, enough of that to go around so again this is an issue that we will be keeping our eye on for you that, now we want to move into the n next section of the, the program and kevin ruiz from treasury strategies corporate practice will talk about experiences and feedback directly from our consulting practice about corporate treasury priorities. Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> uh, thanks for the introduction. As uh, yeah, I appreciate being, uh, being able to attend and, and contribute to the, my first uh, quarterly cash briefing. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about 
our direct experience working with our corporate treasury clients. And I'd like to start by talking about something that you know, a lot of you that are on this call are familiar with, which is our annual State of the Profession survey and webinar that we do. We're in our, the ninth year of that webinar and that survey, and we talk to hundreds of corporate treasurers globally about what's top of mind. Um, some of those issues are perennial issues that we hear quite a bit. But here as we look at slide 10, I want to talk about some of the things that were top of mind this year in the ninth annual survey. Um, a lot of things that we were hearing about were around financial risk management and exposure to FX volatility. Uh, and these are all things, again, that we, that we are working with our clients on as well. Um, the next is about optimizing and centralizing the treasury function and what that means, how it's done, what the trigger is for that sort of decision, and uh, what the benefits are from that. The next topic that, that we hear a lot as top of mind and, and something that we do a lot of work around is operational efficiency. Do we have all the nuts and bolts in place? Do we have the right people in the right positions with the right skills? Another is bank relationship management and really bank relationship optimization. How is that structured from a global liquidity perspective? And are our corporate clients getting the most value from their bank relationships? Another is cash visibility and the ability to forecast cash. In other words, are, they, are, are our clients able to see where their cash positions are and are they able to make long-term strategic decisions based on where their cash is? The next is reporting, and there's a lot of things that we hear about reporting, not just are we getting the right information to the right people at the right time, but do we have confidence in that information? And that, that issue is closely tied to the technology that supports our, our, our uh, treasury clients. This year, uh, one that's become top of mind is cyber risk, and partially that's coming from uh, you know, a lot of things that we're hearing in the media anecdotally, and partially it's coming from the fact that we know that as we've battened down the hatches within the overall business that some uh, less than, I guess I would say, nefarious actors are starting to uh, ping the treasury function directly. And then there's those perennial questions such as access to credit and the ability to optimize the balance sheet. And we're hearing things from our clients um, such as, you know, it took, it took one of my clients, it took that organization three years to come to the conclusion that it's not just about adding more controls in the environment, it's about optimizing the control environment, about picking the right controls. I was just talking to a client in San Francisco earlier this week that had told us, you know, if you have all the controls in place that, that you can possibly come up with, well, you're not really doing business because you aren't able to actually function. So it's about picking the right risks and the right level of risks. Another comment we've heard is that our clients are holding on to cash for future opportunities such as mergers and acquisitions but in reality, they don't even know what's coming down the road because they don't have visibility to cash, because they don't have a robust reporting system, because they don't have that technology to support strategic decisions that can move to business. Another comment we're hearing is that you know, our clients don't have full, full vis visibility to or full confidence in the various cash flows that are coming in from different parts of the organization. So again, they aren't able to make these long-term strategic decisions and they're they're, as a result, holding a cushion of cash for what is inevitably characterized as a rainy day. Another comment is that, you know, we, they'd love to take on more strategic initiatives, but they don't have the time or resources to even get the, the, the blocking tackling, right, the nuts and bolts nailed down to begin with. <clears throat> so as we talk to our clients about moving from a tactical position to more of a strategic position, our clients are saying, yeah, we'd, we'd love to do a lot of these robust these advanced uh, initiatives that, uh, that, that we all talk about, but the elementary stuff, getting the bank reconciliation right, getting the morning cash positioning right, those are still struggles. Finally, we hear things such as investing short-term cash is still a challenge, still a conundrum for, for our clients. And that's something that we hear consistently. Now, when we went through the uh, State, of the, State of the Profession survey and we went through that, that, that ninth annual survey earlier this year, uh, there's other issues that we didn't necessarily hear, and these are issues here on slide 12 that Treasury Strategies is bringing to our clients and things that we're working on right now, which uh, I, I expect to see um, becoming more and more prevalent as the year goes on. 
Number one, and this is something that, that uh, Tony and the other panelists are going to be talking about this morning, the changing interest rate environment. Uh, as we have this, this interest rate, I think we characterize it as a potential takeoff. What does that mean for the corporate treasury, both on the, on the, the debt side and the investment side? And where are they going to, where are they going to park their cash, uh, in a, in a valuable and optimized way as, as the interest rate environment changes? The next, uh, issue that we're hearing a lot about is technology consolidation. You know, we, I think perennially when I, when I speak to corporate treasurers and even the CFOs, uh, they talk about the challenges of having multiple platforms that do, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and there may not be a best solution for everything. And we hear a lot of our clients asking, you know, what's the easiest solution? What's the least passive resistance? What's the, what's the thing that brings the least fatigue and the most benefit to our, to our environment to help us make decisions? You know, as we talk about uh, corporate objectives, it's not so much about having robust technology, it's about getting things done with the least amount of friction, right? The next is country and political risk, and that's another issue that we're going to be talking about today, uh, both with Greece, with China. Uh, we could talk about Puerto Rico as well and some of the issues that are going on there. Uh, the next is the changing payments landscape. That's, that's an issue that we've heard a lot about that we're, we're working on as well. Um, the last two, you know, talent and succession planning is something that, that we all talk about, but Legal and regulatory changes, the, the issues that are around Basel III, that are around Dodd-Frank, the Durbin Amendment, a lot of these challenges that, that they're impacting our treasury, uh, treasury consultant, or our treasury clients directly are things that are becoming more and more important to us, uh, you know, as we move forward in the year. And some of the results that we're getting as we're working with our clients are, you know, that improved visibility to cash, that improved ability to allocate working capital greater efficiency, greater documentation and control environment, a, a better understanding of risks, not just the risks that we know about, but also what do we not know about and how resilient are we against that risk environment. And, if, and then one more thing I want to point out before we move on here is we're helping our clients move from that reactive tactical, that tactical positioning to freeing up time, creating efficiency to take on more strategic initiatives to help the business perform. So, Tony, I'm going to hand it back to you and let you talk about the Game Changers. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we, we have five issues that we'd like to discuss this morning that are uh, top of mind. Uh, the Greek debt crisis, uh, which changes by the minute, uh, volatility in China, uh, the rate liftoff, shortage of high-quality liquid assets, and uh, global bank repositioning. Uh, our, our panel, who's going to assist us here, uh, Debbie Cunningham, of the Chief Investment Officer of Federated Investors, uh, Peter Matza, who's an Engagement Director at the Association of Corporate Treasurers, and Roger Merritt, a Managing Director at Fitch Ratings. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we were having some technical difficulties getting everyone in. Uh, Debbie or Peter, were, were we able to connect? Roger? Roger, are you on the line? Yes, Tony, can you uh, hear me? Fantastic. Well, if we can make contact with, with Debbie and Peter, we will get, get them in shortly as well. So the first issue is the Greek debt crisis, and you know, this is an issue that's been around for a long time, and it's our sense that uh, you know, a lot of the Greek debt is now held in uh, government uh, or central bank or uh, uh, you know, global government agency hands, and the debt that, that, that's held privately is really held by sophisticated investors uh, who are general, generally, not necessarily, uh, certainly, uh, familiar with, with with all the risks. Roger, could you take a second and uh, share with us your perspective on the Greek debt crisis and, and particularly, uh, you know, how that relates to corporate short-term investing? Yeah, sure, Tony. Happy to. Um, yeah, Fitch Ratings has had uh, Greece, as, as you as you indicated, this has been a, a rolling crisis for some time. Um, 
I don't know if you recall, but when we ended our last quarterly cash briefing, uh, you know, I think we said, you know, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. <laughs> and uh, and I think, you know, that continues to be the case. We've had Greece uh, lowly rated for some time, deep into uh, speculative grade territory. Um, in the last week or two, the rating's been lowered even further down to double C, which means uh, it's consistent with a deeply distressed rating. And we've and we've said that you know the the, the most recent no vote uh, um, the you know, that was uh, uh, was reached uh, when Greece had its referendum last Sunday dramatically increases the risk of of a, a disorderly Greek exit from the eurozone. Um, you know it's still possible we'll get an agreement and uh, uh, and as you said it's um, a very fluid situation, but you know I think uh, you know time is short and uh, um, you know it's going to really depend on all the all the parties getting it right. Uh, Tony, but, this uh, is Debbie Cunningham. Yeah, Debbie, I, can right. you hear me now? Yes, and uh, I, I was just going to ask you, you know, you, you're very deep into the markets every day. Uh, could you share with us your thinking about the Greek debt crisis? Well, the Greek debt, debt crisis has been going on now for, I think it started in 2011 maybe with others, you know, not just them, but on the peripheral country basis. Um, so, you know, four plus years. And the good thing about that is that time allows things to start to fix themselves even while the problem is still occurring. So, you know, had the Greek debt uh, crisis escalated quickly in the 2010-2011 time frame, there would have been worse ramifications. As it is right now, all of the large global banks in the world that at one point had exposure to the Greek bank have now gotten rid of it. They've either written it off, you know, down to, to pennies, um, or they, they've sold it off, um, also worth pennies probably at the time. So really the, the, the exposure lies with, with large supranationals, the World Bank, the IMF, um, the ECB, various other central banks within the world. And as such, that kind of eliminates the, the, the problem of Greek, Greece itself, you know, from the higher quality exposures of money market funds as well as other, uh, you know, types of cash products in the, in the, in the country. What is the next question and the next step is, you know, peripheral. What happens on the periphery side of the equation? Um, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, those are all sort of the next set of countries that would be potentially, um, you know, problematic in the context of being able to meet all the requirements from a debt repayment perspective that the ECB has set forth. Now, so far, those countries have been performing magnificently. Um, they've been impacted a little bit from a spread widening perspective with regard to their public debt, um, but the exposure, again, from a money fund perspective is, is, is slim to, to none at this point, so the cash markets have not been impacted. Now, if it goes beyond those four countries, then you're starting into countries like France and Germany, um, the Netherlands, other countries that, um, you know, are obviously large exposures from a cash perspective. But at this point, there doesn't seem to be any indication that that um, sort of slippery slope has, has, has any traction to it. So what we're hearing from Roger and Debbie are both of the, the markets are well aware of, of and have been well aware for a long time of what's going on. Portfolios have been adjusted. So from, from the standpoint of uh, investors, uh, unless you're doing something really exotic, you, know, you, you, you pretty much have green lights in, 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 in your standard investment options. Now, that may or may not be the case for China. And what I'd like to do for, for, for the next game changer is uh, – bring back Kevin Ruiz, uh, who's actually an uh, expert in political and country risk. And Kevin, could, could you just take a minute or two and, and provide your perspective on the current volatility in China? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tony. So what I think we're seeing right now is China's you know, moving to make major changes to suspend trading operations uh, with, what I believe, half the stocks in the marketplace as of uh, early this morning. Um, what the real concerns are, and this is coming from both, uh, you know, my thinking from a financial perspective as well as a political and economic perspective, is what happens if that suspension becomes greater, if it turns into something much like an Indonesia suspension where the whole market is suspended for whoever knows how long. Uh, the 19th People's Congress is uh, portraying an image of control, not just economically, but politically, and the question is, is when, is the, when does the population start to believe that that control is not as strong as, as might be believed? You know, you have uh, threats of 
traders being arrested for making speculative trades on the streets, and these, these are serious threats, and you start to wonder when does leadership lose the mandate for, for change. And I recognize this is not the same type of uh, dem democratic system that, that we might think of uh, here in the United States or, or in the West, but there is still that need for that mandate. And when that mandate's lost, there may be a great problem. And unlike in Greece, where you may see an issue with Eurozone exposure, China's challenges are global. And that becomes a much greater uh, question mark, a much greater game changer for all of us as we think about potentially exposure to the renminbi, but also exposure politically and economically. Thanks, Kevin, and we're going to be counting on you to stay on top of the issue and uh, keep us and all of our clients informed. Uh, I'd like to turn back to Debbie uh, on, on the topic of interest rate liftoff uh, and projections about when the Fed is likely to begin rising rates, uh, raising rates, excuse me, and uh, what that does also in other other Western economies, not just the U.S. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I, I was hopeful that we would have already begun the liftoff, which has obviously not <laughs> occurred yet at this point. Um, we are in the camp that September is the most likely date. Um, it is a, a meeting with a press conference after it. Uh, the only other press conference meeting for uh, the remainder of 2015 is the December meeting, and December's just not a good time to start policy changes. There's already enough volatility in the marketplace from a year-end positioning perspective. So I think the, the Fed would tend to avoid that. Um, the July and November meetings, which are yet remaining, um, are neither one of press conferences. However, there is the mechanism of the conference call that's set up now that, that uh, Chair the, the chairperson, um, you know, began earlier this year. So the possibility of starting, you know, with one of those meetings is still there, you know, and, 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 and announcing it and talking about it a little bit more fully on the conference call basis. Uh, we still think that, that September is the, the more likely scenario. Certainly, um, we've had a state of rather good economic statistics. I think, you know, the basis of, of, of watching what's happening from a statistical perspective and an economic data standpoint is one that we're all attuned to now, and the Fed has told us that that's what we should be watching. Um, having said that, uh, it seems to have gained some strength. Certainly the second quarter is a lot stronger than the first quarter. And what we've seen so far from, you know, the employment data, from the inflationary data, from the um, ISM numbers, both industrial and non-industrial, manufacturing, non-manufacturing, seem to be um, putting us still on that glide path towards September. Um, the, the, the difference basically will be with the process once the Fed does start, given that the Fed funds target rate is no longer as applicable a tool as it has been in the past, we think the tools will be more in line with the reverse repo uh, facility out of the New York Fed. In, to some degree, the Fed funds um, rate that's in, in, in implied in the marketplace, um, the, uh, the, the, the interest on excess reserves, the IOER, which is today the high end of the 0 to 25 range, and we think that 25 to 50 basis point range, it will remain um, the high end of that, and then the term deposit facility from the bank. So all of those things will play key roles, I can hear the and, and it seems as though um, we'll be able to use that uh, information that comes out of the I Fed the to make sure no that the um, ah. so uh, to make to, to make sure that the, the that the you know the the, the appropriate um, targets themselves are actually reached. The Fed has tested it, and I think they're comfortable with it at this point. And September seems the likely scenario. Great. And the good news on all of this uh, is that Peter Moss has been able to connect, even though things are on strike in London. Welcome, Peter. Thank uh, you. And <laughs> uh, I, I, I could see you on online, uh, yeah. at least with, with the video connection, but the, not the audio. Thank you. Uh, and we were discussing the rate liftoff. Uh, I'm going to turn to Roger Merritt next, and then Peter will have you chime in. Sure. Uh, Roger, as um, someone who rates portfolios, uh, how, how, how do you uh, how, how do you analyze who's positioned well for the, for, for the liftoff? 
Uh, you and I have memories that go back to the 1994 rate liftoff, and that ended badly. <laughs> uh, yes, it did. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I am uh, I am old enough to remember 1994. In fact, I I started at Fitch Ratings in 1994, so uh, I, I I do vividly remember uh, you know the Fed raising rates uh, sequentially uh, starting in January of 1994. Uh, 300 basis points, and we saw a, um, a pretty similar rise in the long end of the curve. The 10-year Treasury went up from about a little over 5 percent to peak just north of the 8 percent. Um, so, you know, I think the, the the difference today is that the money fund industry is uh, is, uh, is is I think well positioned for a rate rise. So, we put out a report recently looking at the, the weighted average maturity of uh, Prime money funds across uh, uh, in, in the U.S. and uh, across all U.S. prime money funds, uh, the WAMs were around, uh, I would say, 35 to 40 days. And um, so, you know, it would take a substantial rate increase, uh, um, well in excess of anything we've seen uh, historically, to, to to for um, for that to threaten the, the the NAV stability of the funds. Um, you know, that being said, there are there are we also saw significant differences across funds, uh, with some as low as you know 10 to 15 days weighted average maturity, some with weighted average maturities uh, out uh, closer to 50 days. So uh, um, I think that's an, an important measure to to look at for those who are investing in money funds and have a uh, and you know and, and take that into consideration based on your view of the timing and the magnitude of the liftoff. Thank you. Now, Peter, at the Association of Corporate Treasurers, your clientele uh, is worldwide, and, and, and you get feedback regularly. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on uh, the, the Fed and perhaps other central banks be, uh, beginning to raise rates? Um, it's a good question. I think there's probably two ways of looking at it briefly. Uh, the first might be that from a medium to larger and largest corporate size of business, probably most of them are reasonably prepared. They've been active in the bond and the capital markets over the last three or four years. Their balance sheets are stuffed full of cash, as we know, as you've already talked about, and predominantly they're in a good place. Further down the credit curve, it might be a little harder to say. It's not as if, though, it's not been transparent. Interestingly, from my personal perspective, one would have thought that it it's likely, particularly in the UK, maybe other parts of Europe, to have more of an impact on, on personal finance, um, mortgage rates and so on having been low, which may then have a knock-on to individuals as consumers, which clearly could have an impact on uh, certain types of, of corporates, particularly those that are, that are directly consumer-facing. I don't think in general, though, we're hearing a lot of nervousness or worry from people saying, Gosh, if rates are going up, what's going to happen? On the contrary, from a good number of them, those with cash, they probably prefer some rate, some rate rise, because it might put some liquidity back into the marketplace for their for their deposits and their uh, cash as an investment class. So, probably from that perspective, you may get some positive voters. Uh, we're not hearing, I don't think, any any large degree of people being nervous about rate rises in general. And of course, it then depends upon the shape of the yield curve for a corporate borrower. You know, a rate rise in, in today's rate overnight may or may not make a difference to his 30-year borrowing rate. So th that's, I think, another, another factor to be in. The curve rises across the board, perhaps a different matter. I think that that's, that's remains to be seen, what sort of yield curve we end up with once these rate rises uh, start taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, so we have th three uh, interesting perspectives on the rate liftoff. If we move across to the, the global bank repositioning game changer, as many of you know and many of you have been informed by some of your banks, uh, banks are sharpening their focus on what it is they're doing. And uh, many, many of you have received notices from some of your banks that they are no longer going to be doing businesses in the countries where they have been serving you or they're no longer going to be offering uh, specific services that used to be part of the portfolio that you, you, you were uh, uh, buying from them. Uh, th th this is certainly disruptive, and from our sense of Treasury strategies, as we, as we consult to uh, large global banks, uh, you know, the, there's, the, there, there's a lot more trimming, a, a lot more focusing uh, yet to come. 
Uh, let, let me start with 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 Peter on this. Um, how how are your clients uh, looking at this, and, and and what kind of things are 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 you seeing from a bank repositioning standpoint? We're probably seeing a couple of things. I, I believe I may have mentioned in in the last conversation that this is both product and geographic in in its nature. Um, more recently, we've seen um, a bank that's been cited as a good example of this, RBS, actually taking steps to reach an agreement with another bank, BNP Paribas, as a referral bank for its clients. Uh, whether those clients want to move to that bank or not is 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 a is a moot point. I think we're seeing we're seeing something slightly else as well, uh, which is the repositioning in terms of the bank's uh, capabilities to provide uh, funding under committed. Uh, lines of credit and whether there's going to be regulatory issues with that and whether or not um, banks are prepared to follow up on those lines of, of credit if uh, corporates want to draw upon them. That, I think, is a sort of another thread that's going along with this repositioning. Um, but I don't think we're seeing a slowing in that. Um, one could even argue uh, this week that the events at Barclays in terms of of them uh, losing a chief executive might suggest that, that as an institution they're having another think about which direction that they want to go in. It may be positive for some, may not be positive for all. But I certainly think that turmoil is still out there, and I think we get a sense, and certainly a sense from, from our membership, that banks are still, to some extent, trying to discover who they are, what they are, what they want to say, and, and who actually they want to talk to, what audiences they want to engage with, uh, and what uh, types of products they, they want to engage with. I think behind that as well, if you look at some of, the, some of the things happening in the tech world, there's also, I think, quite a lot of conversation taking place in terms of not just the impact of tech, but where banks are positioning themselves in that conversation. That's a little bit under wraps to an extent, but it's certainly bubbling on under the surface. Is it directly in people's faces? Not so much unless or until they get an RBS type situation or an HSBC or somebody's broadcasting and saying we're out of these markets, we're out of those product lines over X period of time. And then clearly then it comes home to roost. Treasurers, I think, have just got to be adaptable, they've got to be agile, and they've got to look at their bank groups and say to themselves, not just what works for us product-wise, but geographic-wise, but perhaps politically and culturally, maybe those issues are becoming more important. And Kevin, you're working very closely with the Treasury Strategies client right now on, on, on this. Could you, could you chime in for a second? Yeah, thanks, Tony. I, I, would, uh, I would add that uh, a number of our clients are looking at this and, and coming to us with these questions specific to um, RBS, uh, but to a, a, a greater extent, you know, the, the changing relationship that they have with their banks and I would, I would say that this is not just a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for corporate treasurers to look at their global liquidity structure and consider how can we optimize that, not just change the, that single relationship, but really use this as a springboard for optimization. Great point. I, 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 wanna, I have a specific question for Roger on this. As, as, as an organization that rates banks, uh, do you see this as plus or minus or uh, too early to tell? Uh, uh, thanks, Tony. Yeah, we uh, Fitch does rate uh, actually uh, of the three global rating agencies. I think we rate the most financial institutions globally, and um, you know it's certainly impacting how we how we look at these institutions and how we and how we rate them. You know, so uh, you know we're seeing executive level, uh, boardroom level uh, changes at some of the global banks like Deutsche Bank. Uh, I think you know in the news today, Barclays announced that their CEO uh, was was leaving. Um, so uh and you know and as peter mentioned we're seeing banks uh you know say you know these the, there's certain uh countries and certain business lines that you know that are no longer attractive to us so that you know naturally we have to reflect that in and how we uh how we rate the banks and what we think about um their ability to uh successfully execute on some of these new strategies thanks uh I I, th I think that, that that's great information. Now, I'd, I'd like to close with one last question directed to Debbie uh, regarding the high-quality liquid assets. And, De Debbie, there's been a lot of conversation about whether the regulatory requirements for banks and other institutions and fund companies to hold high-quality liquid assets is actually creating a shortage of available supply. And... Um, yeah, you know, I'd, 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 I'd like to know if, if, if you're seeing that or if, if, if you're expecting that and how you would deal with that. 
Um, sure, Tony. We're, we're actually seeing um, probably a flat uh, to maybe slightly down supply of most high-quality liquid assets in the marketplace at this point. Um, Treasury supply for 2015 is expected to be up, um, but for most other, you know, high-quality assets that money funds invest in and that cash treasurers look at, um, to include CDs from banks, to include government agency debt, Fannie Freddie, Home Loan Bank, um, those are all basically flat to slightly down. So Treasury is up slightly, the others are flat to slightly down, and and essentially. Um, it's not created too much of an imbalance yet, but our expectations would be that if uh, regulatory changes, both from a banking perspective as well as from a money market fund perspective, um, start to kick in in 2016, probably mid-year as we would expect, um, some of those balance, imbalances will become a little bit more pronounced. We think there will be more of a demand for the Treasury side of the equation from, you know, the securities that are uh, cash eligible or money market eligible from the Treasury side um, and less of a demand for some of the others. So we think that the spread um, will widen between Treasury securities and let's say bank CDs and, and commercial paper, high quality commercial paper, um, and, and effectively, you know, that, it, that Treasury uh, uh, rates will be held very, very low because, because of those um, imbalances that will occur. Not so much have, seeing it happening yet, but expecting it in the, in the near future. So this is something that we'll need to keep our eye on and we'll be uh, revisiting in future cash briefings. At this point, I'd like to thank our, our partners and sponsors, uh, Debbie Cunningham from Federated Investors, Peter Matza from the Association of Corporate Treasurers, and Roger Merritt from Pitch Rating. Please take a minute and visit their websites, and the links and everything will be on the, the deck that you're, you're, you're about to receive. We also want to thank you for your business. It's the consulting work that you hire us to help you with uh, that uh, – allows us to have these insights and to put on these kind of webinars. You'll all receive a, a, a deck and a direct link. We'll also send everyone a summary of the uh, Q&A. We'll provide everyone with an answer to that. And I'd like to uh, point you to our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can see in, in the bottom right the, uh, the direct link is uh, – go into YouTube at Treasury Strategies, Inc. Consulting. However, if you simply go into YouTube and search on, on, the, on the keyboard Treasury Strategies, you will see dozens and dozens and dozens of videos uh, and our thought leadership and intellectual capital organized in a way that you can easily access, and we hope you join us there. Click the subscribe button. That helps our ratings go up and makes, makes our uh, intellectual capital easier for you to find in the long run. And we invite you all to join us for our next quarterly cash briefing, which will be on Thursday, the 8th of October. Thank you all very much.